Um, I am Hannah Foxwell and I am the product manager at Save Density and um, today I'm going to talk about resilience. Not resilience in the usual way we talk about it, not the resilience of our systems but the resilience of ourselves and of our teams. And to start with I want to reflect on the fact that actually us as humans we're not at all like the machines and the computers that we work with. You are not immutable, you are not highly available, and you are ephemeral. And sometimes, you know, we forget that. Uh, there is no failover for you. There is no disaster recovery plan. There is no rollback. And no matter who you are, we all have a breaking point. And sometimes our work can push us to that breaking point. So today I'm going to talk about some of the ways that we actually need to change um, the way we work together um, so that we can improve our own resilience and help the people around us improve theirs. To start with, I want to introduce the idea of HumanOps. Um, so HumanOps is a community that was started last summer um, by Server Density, and I've been involved with it ever since. Uh, HumanOps, the aim of it is to start a conversation about the human impact of working in technology. So Server Density is a monitoring product. It's a product that will literally wake you up in the middle of the night and ruin your weekend plans when things go wrong. And we take that really seriously um, as a responsibility. And so we started a conversation about actually how can we be more responsible um, about the people who we employ to do these jobs. One of the principles of human ops is that the well-being of human operators will impact the reliability of systems. And we sort of instinctively know this to be true. I mean, how many people have made a mistake when they've been tired um, after being up all night on call? Who's ever done their best work when they're under immense pressure and they're feeling stressed? Um, no one, certainly not me. Um, and although automation is improving all the time and we, we can't yet operate our systems without some form of human intervention. Um, we as humans, um, the operations teams that support them, the development teams and the engineers that build them, uh, we are part of this system and we need to be considered as part of this system. Our resilience matters as part of this system. So let's talk about resilience. Um, by definition, it is the ability to recover quickly from difficulties. And it's um, the same definition, whether we're talking about our platforms that we engineer or our people um, that we train and support. And I mean, who here spends their day thinking about resilience from a systems perspective? I mean, who's ever configured a, a, a load balancer or a cluster? Who has ever backed up their data? You know, we're thinking about resilience day in, day out, but we spend zero time thinking about our own resilience, our own ability to recover quickly from difficulties. And in my career, I have experienced a lot of challenges um, in the things that I've done. And I can tell you that the most difficult challenges to overcome are the people problems um, and the people challenges. People are more difficult to work with than machines. And when you break a person, he can't be fixed. And this is a fascinating and terrifying statistic um, when you reflect on the amount of stress that we can quite regularly encounter in our, in our jobs, whether that be um, shipping a new feature on time or responding to an incident that has taken out production. Um, but 70% of us regularly experience physical symptoms due to stress. And the reason that I come here and I talk about this, I, I'm, I'm particularly susceptible to this. The only way that I know that I'm stressed is because I manifest it physically. I get eczema on my hands. Um, when stress is really bad, I get tension in my shoulders and that triggers off migraines. And all of a sudden I can't see out of my left eye. And this is how I know that I'm stressed. Um, which is, which is sort of extreme, but 70% of us experience these symptoms. You know, this is not an uncommon thing. Uh, and if you're working in a stressful environment, you're having a real physiological and health impact on 
everybody in that team. And I'm not saying that like you are having a, an impact. I'm saying that the environment is having an impact on you. But we as people are part of that environment and we can do things um, to help ourselves and help each other. But before I talk about resilience and some of the psychology of resilience, I want to digress for a moment and talk about change. Um, because change is inevitable in our careers of choice. Um, change is for sure inevitable. We will never be standing still. Um, there will be no um, there will be no steady state for us. There will always be new technologies, and technology change is increasing and accelerating all of the time. How many people in this room have had to learn a new technology over the past year? Can I get like a show of hands? Yeah, that's basically that's everyone. How how many have had to learn one this week? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's quite a few. So you know. We, we have to do this constantly because um, the rate of change of technology is increasing so much that you know, we, we sometimes feel like we have to run to keep up with it. But we're human um, and you can't just flip a switch overnight and upgrade yourself. Um, for people, change takes time and change takes effort. And you know, we're not only talking about learning a new set of skills, but sometimes we're talking about big transformational changes to the way that we work and the tools that we use and the technologies that we use. You know, we're either talking about moving to the cloud or we're talking about DevOps transformation or digital transformation. All of these things completely throw our routine and our comfortable working processes up in the air and we have to find ourselves again in this new world. And when we're dealing with these changes, we kind of often tackle it in the same way we do a software development problem. I thought I could fix everything with engineering. Unfortunately, when we're dealing with people um, and we're dealing with changing people, we can't apply the same process as if we were building a new piece of software. So in the course of my career, I've been Come convinced that the only thing that we can rely on um, in technology is the fact that it will change and that we will be required to go through this process time and time again. And the better we prepare ourselves for that, the more successful and happier we will be. So um, I want to tell you a story now about my first day of work. I don't mean the first day of sort of a regular job, I mean, my, the first day of a proper job after I left university. So after I left university, I went to work at um, Tesco um, in their head office. So I was on a graduate training program within their technology team. And the very first day of working at Tesco, they shipped us off to this fancy country house and they wheeled in a load of very important looking directors in suits. Uh, just as an aside, I wore a suit myself because at the time I believed that's what people in IT wore and I was very wrong. <laughs> Those suits have never been worn. Um, but, but yeah, there's only one part of that day that really I still remember so vividly and it was this one guy who came and talked to us about the well of despair. So. He talked to us about something called the emotional cycle of change, and he warned us that we would all go through it. He said, actually, there's this huge change happening in your life right now. You've left university. You might have moved house. You could be living with different people. Your routine is going to be completely different, and you're starting a new job, and you're going to be wildly ambitious to start with, and then you're going to realize that you don't know anything. And he said... And that's normal, and that's okay, and you're going to go down into the well of despair, but it's completely okay. And he said, the best thing that you can do when you're in that well of despair, and you feel like you're never going to be good at this job that you've signed up for, is to keep going. And if anything, talk about it. Talk about it with your peers. And that's exactly what we did, because he gave us permission to feel that way. Um, 
we slumped down in the canteen and instead of pretending everything was rosy and that we were excelling in our new careers as project managers and business analysts and whatever else we were, uh, we would just slump down and say, I'm in the well of despair. I've been given this new project and I have no idea what to do next. And just being able to talk about it was incredibly powerful. And I've always remembered um, the warning that we received from, from that guy that day. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the well of despair and the emotional cycle of change, because I think when we go through these transformational changes within technology, we can experience this. We can experience the well of despair. I don't know how many of you have been part of a large scale transformation program, but you know, so many of them stall, so many of them have false starts. Some of them, so many of them come across resistance and you feel like you actually can't keep going. And that's largely to do with this process that is completely normal and that we all go through. So here is the emotional cycle of change. Um, we start at the peak of uninformed optimism where we're wildly ambitious and we don't know what we don't know. Um, we have no idea of the challenges that lie ahead, but pretty soon we start to learn. As we start to make progress, we slump down slightly uh, into informed pessimism. Okay, maybe this isn't as easy as we first thought. And that's where we can very easily, um, if we don't correct ourselves, slip into the well of despair. And this is where our motivation is it at its absolute lowest. Um, a lot of the time, this is where projects go to die. Um, you don't feel like you can continue. You don't feel like there's any reason to continue. But if you do persevere and if you do, you start to climb back up um, through hopeful realism and then eventually uh, obtain the peak of rewarding completion. Um, and of course, this is a, a simplified model, but it's a helpful way to think about it. So if you ever feel like you've been down there, you know, it's, it's a completely normal thing that you're going through. Um, but for me, the rewarding completion never seems to come because if it's not one transformational change, if we're not doing the agile thing, then we're doing the TDD thing or we're doing the BDD thing or we're going um, cloud native or we're going serverless or we're doing containers or we've got this Kubernetes thing and we're transforming all the time and it can feel like the emotional cycle of change is actually a roller coaster and we're sort of having to drag ourselves out of this well of despair continuously and that's kind of what we're signing up for in technology today because change is constant and it is challenging Quite a nice illustration of this um, is by Thomas Friedman in his book, Thank You for Being Late. And um, essentially what he's saying in this book is the, the pace of, and the rate of change of technology is growing exponentially. And at the moment, it's outstripping our sort of innate human adaptability, and that's why it can feel so uncomfortable at times and it can feel really um, like an impossible challenge. And it's, you know, and it's difficult to sort of figure out ways and coping mechanisms to, to catch up. And that's when you can slip down into the well of despair. But um, luckily a lot of smart people have done some thinking um, and we need to learn from those people. Um, so learning faster and governing smarter, which basically, as far as I can tell, is DevOps, it's lean, it's agile, it's learning from all of these people who've come before us who have done these tried and tested methods and have adopted continuous improvement within their organizations to help them deal with the change when it inevitably hits you, um, that have made this a little bit easier to manage. So back to resilience, because this is how it fits in with change. How can we make the well of despair more of a bump in the road? Actually, the answer is resilience, um, our own resilience. We're not talking about the resilience of our plant, we're talking about human resilience. This is how we negotiate changes gracefully um, without slumping into that well of despair and losing all of our motivation. 
And the interesting thing um, when I was researching resilience is that resilience is not something innate. Resilience is not something that you either have or do not have. It's not a personality trait. It's not in your genes. Resilience is simply a set of skills that can be learned and developed over time if we choose to do so. We can actually get better at this and make our lives easier. It was a um, psychologist in the 1950s called Ebi Varner who decided to study resilience in detail and she followed um, a group of people from their childhood over the subsequent four decades to analyze resilience um, what caused some people to succeed and others fail um, what made it easier for some people to handle the challenges that life threw at them and and what caused other people to falter and the moral of the story is that resilience is not something that people have or do not have. It's behaviors, thoughts, and actions that can be learned and developed in anyone. And it can be greatly improved by factors around you within your environment. It was a psychologist called Garmizi um, who later um, studied resilience and kind of turn the tables on how we look at it. Instead of looking at, for like definitive reasons why some people struggled with challenges and others succeeded, he looked at something he, call, um, something he called protective factors. Actually, what are the elements of an individual's environment, background or personality that, actually, that enable success? Um, what are the things that have a positive influence on this person's resilience, um, despite the challenges that life has thrown at them? And one of the most sort of pivotal aspects of this is your locus of control. So um, essentially, this is this is the voice in your head, in a sense. This is your sense of control over your own destiny. And it's completely subjective, and it's about learning these thought patterns within yourself. Some people naturally do this, some people naturally don't do this, but you can train yourself to have a greater internal locus of control. And an internal locus of control is linked to greater resilience in the face of adversity. Someone with an internal locus of control believes that outcomes are within their control and are determined by their hard work, attributes and decisions. They believe that they, as an individual, can have an influence on the outcomes. Whereas the person with the external um, locus of control is more likely to believe in fate, that they're helpless, um, that things are being done to them, and that there's nothing that they can possibly do um, to change the outcome of a scenario. It's the difference between thinking this is impossible and thinking this feels impossible right now, so maybe I'll take some steps to understand it better. And it's really closely linked to the concept of a growth mindset, if, if anyone's heard um, any talks on that. So, you know, people with a growth mindset believe that if they don't have a skill right now, they can, they can learn it. And there's been a lot of work done to encourage, you know, working environments and cultures that um, that promote a growth mindset. If you can't do it now, that's okay. You can learn. And now in the next few slides, we've got, a, we've got a little bit of Hannah science. Now I haven't got these bits from a psychologist or from a textbook, but this is me applying some Hannah logic to the things that I understand about resilience, that I understand about working in technology today. Because when I think about DevOps culture, when we talk about the culture um, of collaboration, um, we talk about trust and autonomy. And I look back to organizations I've previously worked in where it was a command and control environment. And I'm thinking to myself, well, which, which environment did I feel like my actions had a direct result on that outcome? Where did I feel most in control of my own destiny and my own work life? And it, was, and it was where I had um, a, a trusting and autonomous culture um, because that promotes that internal locus of control, which in turn builds the resilience automatically of the people within your organization instead of throwing them down into the well of despair. 
And then I think about the technologies that we talk about in these groups, in, um, in these DevOps meetups. You know, we're really keen on loosely coupled microservices. They're great, um, especially when you compare them to highly dependent monolithic applications. But again, I think to myself, well, which one of those allows me and my team to feel like we can move independently? Which one of them gives us a greater sense of control of our own plans and of our own destiny? You know, there's some of this makes a lot of sense, actually, when you put it into the context of who feels most like they have control, who feels most like um, most like they are empowered to make decisions. We talk about this a lot, but actually the technology has an influence on the environment, which then in turn has an influence on the people who work in that environment. And then I think about tools. So if you're shipping small changes um, continuously through an automated CD pipeline um, compared to managing maybe a quarterly or a six monthly release um, through a long-winded bureaucratic process, who's gonna feel more in control um, there? It's the same point. Um, and I think a lot of the tools and technologies and a lot of the ethos um, around DevOps culture actually all very naturally enables greater resilience within the people and the teams that work in those environments. And you know, this, is the, this is the thing that really you know, is the reason that I am a member of the DevOps community. And it's because I used to manage teams and I used to feel absolutely terrible um, that they were suffering as a result of the, these processes. And I thought there must be a better way. And that's how I discovered um, DevOps and you know, was kind of converted because I didn't just see it as a way of shipping software. I saw it as a way of creating a healthier and happier environment for my teams to work in. And I like to, I like when I'm sort of researching a talk, I like to pull in resources from all different areas. So, you know, I've talked about psychology. My sister's a psychologist, but I was out for a drink with one of my friends who works in a charity. Um, this charity supports um, sort of homeless children in developing nations. And she was going to a conference about resilience, um, which was kind of interesting. And I had a read of some of the material that came out of that conference, and this really struck me. Um, so I won't read this, um, I won't read all of this, but I'll just pick out the bits that I think are sort of translatable into our environment. Resilience is the capacity to navigate their way to resources. And again, it's this, it's the opposite of feeling helpless. Um, it's the ability to find solutions to your own problems to develop that internal locus of control. Oops. So I sort of paraphrase it. Um, and we can ask ourselves this within our own organizations. When faced with a challenge, can I navigate my way towards a solution? You know, how hampered are you by bureaucracy? Um, how many financial challenges and barriers stand in your way? How good is the documentation of this application I need to support? You know, <laughs> Can we find the solutions to our own problems or are, are we highly dependent on other people or other resources? So I'm gonna talk a little bit now about the things that we could do um, to improve the resilience of ourselves and of the teams that we work with. One of the key things that we can do, um, both for ourselves and for the people we work with, is to develop caring, listening, and supporting relationships. And it's really interesting to, to read books about management where they talk about you know, caring personally um, for your team. You know, this isn't this isn't something that we can sort of reserve for the people outside of work. We spend too much time with our colleagues not to care about them personally, um, not to listen to their problems and not to develop those supportive relationships um, when they're struggling. And you know, part of me, part of me thinks that 
when I give this talk, I'm kind of preaching to the converted because you're all here and you're all participating in a community and like it's outside of your day job. And the people that are probably struggling the most with this are the people who aren't in this room. They're your colleagues who are suffering in silence. Um, maybe, they don't, um, maybe they don't know how to help themselves to get out of the well of despair that they found themselves in. Maybe, you know, they're network engineers who don't know where they fit in um, because the company is migrating to the cloud. Or uh, maybe they're wrestling with the idea of serverless, having been, you know, racking servers in a data center their whole life. You know, these are big challenges for people who perhaps have, you know, develop their whole sense of self-worth around being an expert in that domain and that domain is not worth what it was um, and these are you know these are big challenges that we face and we've got people in our teams in our offices who are potentially going through this and you know the best thing that you can do for them is to just be there and to offer that listening ear so um, a few more points um, very briefly about building resilience within your teams and you might want to take a couple of these back to your back to your teams and try them I don't recommend you try them all at once it might be a little bit too much but um, <laughs> you know like I said supporting each other um, developing those relationships getting to know each other um, I can't emphasize how important that is um, for building resiliency within your team blocking my own clicker yep <laughs> um if you have the ability to trust people and give them autonomy uh if you are a technical leader within your team you know try and share some of the decision making occasionally so that it's not always you and even if you do need to do that sort of trust and verify um sort of model for a while until until their skills are developed they're going to feel so much better about their work if you actually trust them um, occasionally with some important decisions, or at least they feel part of it. Providing a sense of purpose um, is also really important. You know, why are we doing what we're doing? Um, we're not just moving tasks along uh, our sort of Jira Kanban boards. Um, we're doing it for a reason, and reminding people of that reason is very important. When you do um, come up against challenges, it's important to have a voice that focuses on the opportunity and remains positive. And I don't think that this is necessarily always delegated to the management. Um, you can't always rely on your managers to be the leaders that you want them to be. And everybody can be this voice and it doesn't matter how senior, senior you are. You can be the person in the room that says, Right, okay, looks like we've messed up. What have we learned? Okay, this is not what we expected, but can we still work with it? You know, focusing on the positives um, can have a massive impact on the people around you, even if, you know, inside maybe you're feeling a little bit despairing. Providing constructive feedback to your team members um, can be really awkward. I know. The worst thing about feedback, from my perspective, is giving it. I can absolutely take feedback and I really enjoy getting feedback and actually I really value feedback because it means I can get better. And I think most people feel this way, but when it comes to giving feedback, I, I, kind, of, I kind of shy away from it. It's difficult to have these conversations. So maybe practice giving feedback or create an environment um, or an activity within your next re retrospective where people can give each other sort of positive and constructive feedback as well. Developing coaching skills. Now this is something that I've had the, I've, I've had training in and I, I've enjoyed doing and it's an incredibly valuable thing. But when you develop coaching skills, what you realize is that the process of thinking something through is as valuable as the answer you get at the end. So when you learn how to be a coach, you learn how to ask open questions and you learn how to get people talking. So if you're interested in, if, or if, if you're in a leadership position or if you're interested in improving management or you just want to help your team get better at their jobs, do some reading about coaching and how to be a coach because it's the most powerful tool. It helps people to help themselves. Uh, 
I think this is probably something I've talked about earlier, but being optimistic and confident in the face of setbacks. Um, you don't have to be the leader or the manager. You don't have to have necessarily have the title to be that person in the room who can set the tone and help everybody through a challenge. And finally, I, like I said, I'm preaching the converted to the converted because you're already here and you're already participating in the DevOps community. But building a community and participating in a community and sharing your problems and talking to people um, is a, a big benefit when you're talking about building resilience. So I've talked about teams and a few things that you might want to take back and try with your teams. But what about you? What can you do as an individual to improve your adaptability? You can take more breaks. I know. <laughs> uh, the amount that you achieve at work is not proportional to the amount of time you spend at your desk. And sometimes it, you can feel guilty for taking time away from your desk. But it's so important to take breaks. Um, the sort of the oxygenated glucose um, that fuels your brain um, actually gets depleted after sort of um, one and a half hours, maybe two hours of concentration. Nobody can work on you know the type of complex problem solving that we do day in day out um, continuously for eight hours. It's just not possible. And if you're trying to, you're kidding yourself because you would be much more productive if you just took that break, allowed your brain to switch, um, to switch what it was concentrating on or to just wander for a while and then resume your task with a fresh mind. If you're feeling stressed, um, one of the most powerful things you can do is just to be aware of it. Um, it's, it, it sounds easy, easier than maybe it actually is, but if you're getting worked up and you're feeling very stressed, um, just take a moment to observe what you're thinking and sort of disassociate yourself from those thoughts. You're not a stressed person, you're just feeling a little bit stressed right now. Um, and once you can disassociate yourself from those thoughts, once you can stop being in that feeling, um, it becomes less powerful and you can do something about it. You can take a step back and decide what action to take. Again, this is probably pretty obvious, but look after your health. Eat some vegetables, do some exercise, drink some water. These are all things that are really important for your brain and your brain is really important um, in terms of managing your mental health and combating stress. And finally, talk about it. If you, really are, um, if you really are suffering, then you cannot do it in silence. And if you don't feel like you can talk to the people uh, in your office um, and your colleagues, find other people you can talk to about it. These can be people at home. Um, they can be people within this community. I'm here and I'm going to be in the pub this evening. Talk to me. Um, talk about it. It's really important just to voice um, how you're feeling. And you'll feel freer as a result. So I want to talk about, very briefly, as I, as I wrap up, um, what I think a career in technology means, because I think that we are, if we, if we stick with this um, for the rest of our careers, we will be challenged, and we will be challenged constantly. But if it doesn't challenge you, it won't change you. And actually, what we are signing up for is a journey of continuous learning and continuous adaptation and continuous change. And me personally, I find that incredibly exciting. Um, but what we need to do is we make, need to make sure that we're prepared for that and that we look after ourselves so that we can sort of take on these challenges head on rather than letting them overwhelm us and send us down into that well of despair. So I'll finish where I started um, with one of the human ops principles. The well-being of human operators impacts the reliability of systems. The resiliency of you and your team will impact the resiliency of your systems. We are humans. We are flesh and bones, emotional, feeling, irrational sometimes, <laughs> people. and. We are just as important as the systems that we support. 
Thank you. So I wanted to say very briefly at the end, this is where people usually go, hey, we're hiring, um, but we're not. Um, <laughs> so you want to work with me? You can. I'm available from January. Um, and I've recently moved to Yorkshire. So if you're doing some interesting work right now, I'd really love to connect with you. <laughs>